Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, looks like there are a couple more people that are still coming in, but we're gonna go right ahead and get started. So my name is Danielle Davis and I'll be coordinating things on the back end for the event. So if you have any questions um, during the event, or at the end, please place them in the Q&A box and Dr. Robinson Lane will review all the questions at the end of the presentation. So for those of you that are new to the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, we're a center here in Ann Arbor and a collaboration between University of Michigan, Wayne State and Michigan State University. We offer a variety of dementia related research studies. And if you're interested in learning more about our wellness programs for caregivers, Lewy Body Dementia Support Groups, or if you want to get in research yourself, then feel free to visit our website, social media, or reach out to me and I'll point you in the right direction. Just to let you know, this event is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube page. Um, so feel free to check back maybe next week and you can share this with others or just review the presentation again yourself. We will have an event evaluation. I'm going to place the link for that in the chat towards the end of the session. And then we're also going to send an email that you'll be receiving. So we welcome and appreciate your feedback. So thank you in advance for taking the time to fill that out. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Sharia Robinson Lane, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Systems, Populations, and Leadership at the University School of Nursing. She has focused her career on the care and support of older adults with cognitive and or functional disabilities. Dr. Robinson Lane is interested in the ways that older adults adapt to changes in health and particularly how adaptive coping strategies affect health outcomes. Her research is focused on reducing health disparities for minority older adults with cognitive impairments and their informal caregivers. Dr. Robinson Lane is a national geriatric lecturer and health educator. So in addition to teaching nursing courses, she's also successfully mentored students from pre-nursing through doctoral level and often engages in local community, <clears throat> excuse me, and a wide variety of topics related to health promotion. So without further ado, I welcome Dr. Sharia Robinson Lane. Thanks, Danielle, and thank um, you all for attending this uh, afternoon. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I got a little baritone in my voice uh, today. I'm a little tickled there, so you'll see me uh, sipping on a bit of uh, tea, both for my um, tickle as well as just for that uh, afternoon perk. Um, I'm really, again, excited to, uh, to be here, um, and I'm thankful for um, funding from a variety of different um, uh, places that have supported the work that I'm doing, including the Michigan Center for Urban African American Research, um, the Center for Complexity and Self-Management of Chronic Disease over at the School of Nursing, uh, the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center here, as well as the Claude D. Pepper Older Americans Independent Center, and the National Institute on Aging, which is funding my current work. Um, which um, all of that allows me to um, engage uh, uh, students in the work that we're doing to help to develop interventions that are culturally responsive um, to the needs of uh, Black caregivers and ultimately support all caregivers and being able to do what they um, have been called to do, which is care for the individuals that they love, and to be able to have the uh, support that speaks to them, support that they can connect with, um, and support that's meaningful um, to them. Um, and so uh, this afternoon, we'll spend a little bit of time talking a bit about the work that I do, as well as um, the important work of uh, caregiving. So right now, we know that there's uh, 41.8 million caregivers in the U.S., according to the Caregiving in the U.S. report that came out uh, last year. Um, these uh, are the number of caregivers that are caring for individuals who are at least 50 years of age and older. Um, and so that, that's a significant amount of the um, population. It looks like there's about 16% uh, um, or so of all caregivers are caring for um, what we would call older adults. And when we look at the primary reasons that people are providing caregiver support, um, this can range from developmental or intellectual disorders. We know that with increasing technology um, and medical uh, 
changes uh, that we have available now, we have more and more individuals that are living longer where they didn't have a long uh, longevity with certain types of developmental disabilities. And so we are starting to see many of these individuals are aging. And so now we're learning and having to figure out how to um, combine services for people who have developmental uh, disabilities that are also facing old age. Um, behavioral issues that individuals have um, maybe dealt with lifelong and now again that's combined with some natural aging changes and require continued caregiver support, uh, memory problems, emotional and mental health issues, long term physical conditions. So this may be related to an individual having a problem like a stroke or paralysis and needing support. And then of course, short term, short term physical conditions. Um, so just like a stroke can cause long term uh, physical complications for an individual and require lifelong care. You also have a lot of individuals that have some short term disabilities that they um, are rehabbing through as a result of that or other sorts of um, injuries. And so when we look across the board at all of these various types of support, uh, mental problems is uh, uh, right there at the top. You know, after the long-term uh, physical conditions, um, you've got memory problems. And so that's going to include dementia. But one of the things to keep in mind is that as individuals um, age and dementia progresses, um, individuals do require more physical support in addition to the other sorts of support that they might need um, just related to the physical problems. And sometimes there is also behavioral issues um, that um, can arise uh, due to some of the memory um, concerns. And so you have individuals that are caring for a variety of conditions um, at home, often um, uh, suddenly, um, and oftentimes without any training or support during that process. So dementia family caregiving is different from other sorts of caregiving in that it really is associated with the most negative health outcomes for caregivers. Um, it's a very uh, stressful type of uh, work that can be very socially isolating for the caregivers, um, as many people don't necessarily understand the challenges of caring for a person with uh, memory loss. And as I mentioned, some of the physical incapacities that come along as the um, various types of dementia progress and eventually cause a person to become more bedridden and more fully dependent on other individuals. Um, and there's also a lot of cultural taboo about speaking negatively about the person that you're caring for, because in many cultural groups, it's considered a privilege and an honor to be able to care for um, your parents or your spouse, um, someone that you love and that has cared for you. Um, and so there also isn't often the opportunity to just sort of vent and talk about the challenges or even speak about the uh, challenges of providing care in terms of um, burden, um, which also creates another uh, layer of um, difficulty in supporting individuals effectively when we can't even use the um, maybe language that might be considered common. When we think about the sorts of support that individuals are providing, we can divide this support up into maybe two different uh, groups of instrumental activities of daily living and then um, activities of daily living. Instrumental activities of daily living isn't something that people think about very often when they think about caregivers and the support that they provide, because these are the sorts of things that increase the quality of life of a person, that um, allow them to be independent on their own, to where they don't really need um, to live with someone else or for someone to come and live with them. So things like being able to appropriately use the telephone both casually to be able to connect with friends and families, as well as in the case of an emergency to be able to call for support when needed, being able to um, go shopping and purchase the things that you want and need, um, in these times of COVID, that might mean navigating the computer and learning how to um, do online um, shopping um, or um, even being able to go and make purchases in the, at, at the store, uh, having transportation, whether that means having your own car and still being able to drive yourself or being able to make arrangement for transportation for yourself and, and to know where to go and then how to get back home, being able to successfully pay bills 
that often is when uh, family members sometimes are alerted for the first time that there's a problem when, you know, the lights get shut off or um, they start to see the cancellation or shut off notices uh, in the mail if they happen to see that, um, which can be, again, very jarring to sort of be um, placed into this space of uh, suddenly finding yourself to having to provide uh, care and to assist with someone that you care for. Meal preparation, of course, and laundry work, and then um, being able to take medications, um, and particularly for older adults who, in many instances, uh, most older adults have at least one chronic condition. So about 93% of older adults have one chronic condition, and um, over 70% have at least two, and many more um, or not more, but you know, many people have m multiple chronic um, comorbidities or chronic conditions that they're managing, which require various medications. And so it's not completely unusual for someone to be taking more than two or three medications, sometimes as many as nine medications and trying to manage all of those and know what they're for and to be thoughtful about the side effects and to be able to communicate um, these things back to the doctor can be really challenging. And so a caregiver may be involved in any or all of these tasks. And when a person has a cognitive impairment such as dementia, they're going to eventually become involved in all of these tasks in addition to the tasks that we see on the right side here, the activities of daily living, which gets more into the physical aspects of care that people um, need assistance with um, as their disease progresses, such as being able to get in and out of bed and in and out of chairs on their own or getting dressed or being able to use the toilet or groom themselves, feed themselves, and then um, even having to deal with and manage um, incontinence. So these are all sorts of um, skills that are not only emotionally, but can also be, think about it, physically taxing to the caregiver. So, um, I mean, just think for a moment about your family members and particularly your spouse um, or your significant other or your close friend um, that, potentially could develop a condition that would need your support and think about what that might mean physically for you and being able to um, actually physically lift that person to help them get out of the bed or how would you bathe them or would you want to bathe them and then do you have the funds to be able to get support if you wanted to get support? And these are the sorts of questions and challenges that caregivers have to face um, all of the time and, and navigate it again without necessarily having or knowing where to go to get the support that they um, that's helpful. So within this, um, this area, um, my work is particularly focused on um, Black caregivers, so Black dementia family caregivers. These individuals are most likely to be engaged with um, high intensity care. And so when we talk about high intensity care, that means that when we look at this slide over here at the instrumental activities of daily living, these individuals are gonna be assisting with just about everything on the instrumental activities of daily list, living list here. And then when we look at the activities of daily living, they're assisting with at least three of the things that are on this list here. Um, and so when you think about the number of hours that individuals are spending providing care, they're spending 40 plus hours a week, um, sometimes in addition to their own jobs, if they're able to maintain a job. Um, we know that for um, Black older adults, once they um, are over the age of 85, they actually have a pretty long uh, life course and a long life trajectory. And so having dementia doesn't necessarily um, decrease their um, their uh, length of um, life. So that means that you can have an individual that you're providing care for for an incredibly long period of time. Um, many people that have heard me spoke before and know that part of the reason that I've become um, very engaged in the dementia world is because um, both of my grandmothers actually um, had uh, different types of dementia. One had Parkinson's and Parkinson's type dementia and another had Alzheimer's um, disease. And um, both of them um, had care needs that were managed. One in particular, um, the care needs were almost um, 10 years um, and the other was around six or seven years. And so these are very long periods of time to provide care as long as possible in the home environment. And then thinking about care transitions into facility-based care if that's what's necessary to support the care needs of that person. And so what that means for the caregiver or the primary person that's involved in coordinating care and supporting that person is that they have a much more likelihood of having poor health outcomes, um, 
they are more likely to have a, a future dementia diagnosis. And uh, for a variety of reasons, it's much more likely that they may experience premature um, death. Oftentimes, this is related to uh, not getting their own health care needs met. You know, when you're in 24-hour uh, 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 responsible for another person, it can be challenging to do some things for your own health, like getting to your own doctor's appointments or um, just taking a break to be able to uh, decompress and de-stress um, to be able to continue to build social relationships. And for um, a particular group of individuals um, that are in that sandwich generation where they're finding themselves caring for both children um, as well as you know, older adult parents, it can be particularly challenging for them as they try to uh, balance both the family life of their own personal family and, and managing that, as well as managing the needs of their um, parents or grandparents. And so it can be a very stressful situation for them. Um, again, there's the increased risk for these caregivers for developing Alzheimer's disease and other cognitive impairments, particularly for um, Black adults. They're more likely to experience mixed forms of dementia, many of which are complicated by cardiovascular disease. Um, and so we're seeing hypertension and diabetes, which then, you know, those are all risk factors for developing um, Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia. And um, they can get all of, you know, have, have to deal with all three. Um, income variances can significantly affect care options. Um, when people try to stay home, they may not necessarily to care for their loved one. They may not always have the financial means to be able to um, do or have a lot of the options that um, um, other groups have, like being able to utilize services like adult daycare or in-home um, private duty uh, staff to assist with bathing and things like that. And so the care options that are available can um, vary if individuals are not familiar with how to um, access insurance benefits of their uh, loved ones to get services that they may qualify for. Um, and the um, caregivers are often compared to um, white caregivers may have a lower level of um, education and again have increased uh, comorbidities and overall disease burden, which puts these particular caregivers at an increased risk for poor health outcomes and increased risk for dementia in the future. The other thing that we know about Black dementia family caregivers is that they really don't use uh, current support services that are available um, at the same rates that other groups and particularly white caregivers do. Part of this um, ha may have to do with geographical constraints of where services are offered. So for example, if we use the University of Michigan as an example, um, the greater um, Ann Arbor community is not necessarily as diverse as say the Detroit community. And so when we're thinking about offering um, services that are in person that caregivers are able to attend, um, geography can certainly make a difference when you add in things like transportation, who's going to watch my loved one while I attend um, you know, a program. And so um, our increasing um, accessibility of offering uh, virtual support sessions, telephone-based support sessions, and these sorts of mediums um, are great opportunities to increase um, our ability to be able to connect with um, diverse caregivers who may have geographical um, constraints. Um, health system membership requirements, um, a lot of this is changing um, in the earlier, um, that goes along with the disease state specific um, requirements. So in some of the earlier days, um, individuals had to have an Alzheimer's diagnosis in order to access particular services or be a member of a particular health system um, to be able to um, engage in particular support services. Um, that has um, changed, um, particularly with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, we know now the Alzheimer's Association is um, trying to be much more vocal about its inclusivity and not just focusing in Alzheimer's disease, but um, supporting individuals with various forms of memory impairment um, and helping to um, connect people with resources, providing support groups, and these sorts of things, as well as the uh, Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center, um, and, you know, supports individuals with various um, cognitive um, disabilities, if you will, and particularly those affecting memory. 
So, and then the final issue um, that we know is present is that many of the caregiver support programs are not really culturally responsive in their design, meaning they don't necessarily take into consideration the unique contributions of individuals' culture into the design or implementation of the programs. And part of that has to do with our research um, approach where we think from um, sometimes a cost-effective uh, perspective where the intervention will be designed with the majority in mind with the intention of perhaps um, fine-tuning the intervention much later to uh, meet the needs of particular groups. Um, and so what that means is that um, in, in many instances, the groups who are uh, maybe most affected by a particular condition or issue um, don't have a tailored or culturally responsive um, intervention for um, much longer um, than, you know, the interventions that are developed uh, to suit, uh, you know, ideally the majority. And then the other things that caregivers have said when we've had caregiver community forums and talked with them about this is that there is the need for more um, um, intergenerational support. We know that uh, when we're caregiving, we have the entire family involved. And so you often have one person that might be the official person if you were to ask who the caregiver is that's involved with care. But really everybody is participating in care. Um, you know, uh, the cousins may be dropping off meals to help to support an individual. You may have someone else that actually gets, as I say, voluntold to go and live with um, the uh, family member. Um, that is needing support oftentimes is somebody who is has um, low resources or low income. Um, the family has decided that that individual doesn't have a lot of responsibilities. And so they're sort of, again, voluntold to go and live with that person, which can then sort of disrupt whatever career plans or um, sometimes education plans that that person may have um, to, um, you know, take care of that responsibility. And then the other thing that caregivers have um, mentioned that is a challenge is that they're just exhausted, you know, when they're trying to work a job and then they're trying to support their loved ones. The last thing that they're thinking about doing at the end of the day is maybe getting on one more call or joining one more Zoom or getting, you know, getting engaged with an additional group. And so it's just, it's physically exhausting uh, work for them as well. And so when we think about intervention design and how to support these caregivers, it's important to consider all of these uh, things. So one of the things that I've done and what my work really focuses on is how do we do it, deal with stress and then what are um, the uh, stress and coping frameworks for intervention design that can be effective in developing culturally responsive um, interventions that facilitate effective coping um, for groups. And that's ideally what you know, I'm interested in doing is how do we help caregivers to manage the stress and to adapt to this new um, situation or condition of um, caregiving so that one, they're able to serve in the caregiver role for much longer um, um, and that they can do so in a way that's healthy to them um, so that they can maintain their health so that we're not decreasing their health in doing that. And so it does two things. It supports the caregiver and it supports the care recipient and that the care recipient is able to ideally age in place around the people that they love for as long as possible. And so with this particular, this um, um, stress and coping model by um, Callista Roy um, looks at stress um, in three different ways and says that stress can be focal, contextual, or residual, and that individuals think about or deal with stress um, where you can have focal stressors or something that's sort of right in your face that you have to manage right at that moment. And so it may be the stress of, um, um, having to stay home because the person needs that level of support that you have to make arrangements perhaps with your job. So that may be a focal stressor and a contextual stressor is something that's sort of in the background that's um, making a difference and it's exacerbating your stress, but it's not the main thing that you're concerned with. So perhaps at the same time, while you're trying to figure out your work status and to be able to support your parent at home, um, you, there's also some relationship issues or you're having some problems with your kids or there's something else sort of in the background that's contributing to that stress, but it's not like the main thing that you're concerned with at that moment, but increasing your overall stress load. And finally, at the bottom here, we've got this uh, residual um, sort of uh, coping, 
which uh, uh, a, this residual has to do with a, a stressor that an individual is not necessarily um, aware of that is um, still influencing the situation. Oftentimes these residual stressors are um, influenced by culture and particularly for um, um, black uh, caregivers can be influenced by racism and um, particularly um, institutionalized racism, which may prevent people from being able to access services, microaggressions that they're dealing with and trying to get information and these sorts of things that can really um, increase their overall stress load. And so when we look at the overall model, which I get, this looks real interesting. Um, essentially what this is, is that the stressor starts over here on this end and then it comes and it, um, how individuals deal with stress, they cope with it. Their self-coping or group identity can be um, their cultural um, identity, which influences how they were um, coping. So keep in mind that everybody has a cultural identity. These are the social um, connections that we all have, um, the ways in which we were raised to, um, to survive in the world. And our first cultural group that each of us had is our, our families. And so, as we um, make decisions, our coping processes that we learn influences our behaviors, which is on the other end. So we start with the stressor and that stressor uh, results in a particular behavior. And some of the, uh, the things that affect how we cope has to do with our uh, physiological response. So if caregivers have health conditions that they're trying to manage, so you have a cancer diagnosis, but you also are a caregiver, but you still have to figure out how to provide care for your um, older adult loved one that is also experiencing memory deficits. Or maybe it's not, you know, as, um, as serious or concerning as a cancer diagnosis, but maybe it's just another sort of chronic health condition that can make um, a difference. Um, how, what your role is, you know, one of the challenges for many caregivers and particularly spouses is this idea that you go from being a wife or a husband to being a caregiver. And what does that mean for the relationship and the, the grieving that takes place with the loss of that um, role as the person sort of shifts from, you know, whatever the role that they had um, into this caregiving role. And then the support uh, that individuals have is where that interdependence comes um, in, is how, how do the systems that are around them support them? I mean, all of that plays a role into how individuals cope and again, influences their coping related behaviors. So again, this is the model that is um, or has influenced the work that I've been um, doing. Some of the premises of this work are that the shared values, beliefs and customs that um, uh, create communities, extend to ways of coping. And then the second premise is that when we identify and reinforce the adaptive coping strategies that communities prefer to use, it strengthens both the community and the individual. And so what that means is that we don't necessarily have to teach people uh, new ways of coping. We can start where people are, the ways that they're used to um, dealing with situations and really amplify that and encourage people to do the healthy things that have been um, working for them. And that's really what leads to, um, I think, more uh, sustainable sorts of um, interventions that are more likely to have an increased uptake by the group. Um, and so the main research question that I've had in the work that I've been doing are what are really the factors that contribute to adaptation? What are the things that um, Black caregivers have already been doing that have allowed them to really be resilient in the caregiving space and to be able to continue to provide care and feel good about it and to be healthy in that process of, of caregiving. And my goal in this work is to really identify a really culturally responsive approach to caregiver support that promotes adaptive coping and optimizes health for caregivers. One of the primary ways that um, I approach this work is by using a community-based participatory research um, approach. And what that is, is just a collaborative and action-based approach to research that um, actively attempts to engage communities in the research process, all the way from development to dissemination. And so that means that I've been engaging um, individuals through questionnaires, through um, informal um, um, interviews to find out about what is it that um, they need as a caregiver? What is it that they would have liked to have had as a caregiver? 
um, when it comes to a support system or a support group. When we look at um, tools that we're developing, um, do they want a tool? And, and if um, we have examples of tools that we are um, looking at, so for example, we're looking at the development of an app, um, you know, we've pulled together community uh, stakeholders and various individuals to talk more carefully about would an app make sense? Would you use this? What are the sorts of things that you would like to see in an app if it allowed you to connect with other caregivers and to um, get information that could support you on your caregiving um, journey? And so uh, this is a, um, a little bit more information about engaging or using this uh, continu continuum of community engagement when we want to engage a CBPR approach in our uh, research. Um, Drusilla Taylor did a great job of um, putting this together. And so um, uh, I think that it, it shows that when we're doing community-based participatory research, it doesn't there's not necessarily a one size approach fits to all and you can engage your um, community in different ways in this approach. Um, a total CBPR um, approach means that you have a um, community um, board usually of members of the community that um, you meet with that help to design the research questions before you even get to the study. Um, and then help with every stage of the process all the way through dissemination. So they actually come and present with you, help to develop articles with you, et cetera. And then on the other end of that community, um, that continuum, you have more so just community engagement where you're working with community members and agencies to reach community members and to get uh, feedback from them. And so um, I think that depending upon the work that individuals are doing, um, it's always important to get the community engaged um, if you're particularly in intervention design um, and especially in intervention design in which we want to engage uh, vulnerable uh, populations and make sure that the intervention that we're working on is um, what they want and what individuals are going to use. So when we're thinking about culturally sensitive responsive protocols, because that's part of it, and some of the things that we can do to make sure that our protocols are culturally responsive are engage in focus groups prior to the study, or if you're going to do a clinical trial before the clinical trial implementation to make sure that um, they can um, preview the intervention and provide feedback on it to make sure um, like I said, it's something that's going to work and something that they're interested in. And then actually using that feedback to make necessary changes before you actually trial that intervention. Um, it's really important to think about population facts and then evaluate those facts for bias. Um, all of us have biases um, and things that we think or believe about particular groups that may or may not be true. Um, one of my first studies was working in, um, I've always worked with older adults, and one of my first studies was in pain management, and I was working with a particular group of community dwelling older adults that lived in public housing, and one of the biases that I had at that time was um, I just was under this impression that all old folks are safe, right? it's a completely safe environment, and so um, on retrospect, that was a completely ludicrous idea, and it definitely was a bias that, for the most part, it was a safe environment, but it wasn't necessarily any safer than any other um, low-income housing environment that you may go to, um, and so um, I uh, wasn't very thoughtful about some of the safety precautions that should have been put into place because of the bias that I had. And fortunately, um, you know, nothing horrible happened, um, but there were a couple of instances in which, you know, we had to um, rethink um, some of our protocols because um, we did have some bias um, that was built in based upon um, assumptions about the population that we were working with. So it is important to sort of, when you're looking at your protocols, um, one, to get feedback from um, individuals that are a part of the community, uh, because sometimes, um, again, because it's a bias, you don't recognize it is until somebody is um, pointing, you know, willing to point it out to you, which means that you also have to be open to that sort of um, feedback and create these trusting relationships with uh, community members in which um, the way in which you engage with them highlights the value um, that they have as um, members of you, you know, the team. 
Um, I think that's really critically important um, so that they feel comfortable and saying, you know, I don't think that that's going to work. Or maybe you should think about carrying all this cash with you, you know, when you are um, here, or maybe you shouldn't go into people's apartments to go and do interviews. Um, maybe it makes more sense to, you know, do this instead. Um, you also want to really think about tar um, implementing targeted recruitment strategies, particularly when you want to engage diverse populations. Um, I talk about this uh, repeatedly. Um, people want diverse samples um, and want to engage diverse groups. And so if you want to have Black folks in your study, then you have to be very um, um, intentional about recruiting Black people. And so if you don't know how to do that, it means that you may have to get people on your team that are able to um, advise you and you have to go where they are um, and think about the different places that they might be. And um, again, thinking about bias, even with that and thinking about where folks might be to um, be able to effectively recruit. And so, so far for um, our studies, we have recruited over 75 um, black caregivers for our um, primary studies and in the national caregiver study that we're currently recruiting for, we've recruited over 120 caregivers. Um, and that study, we just started in December. So we've recruited over 120 black caregivers to participate in that in just about two months, you know, maybe a month and a half. Well, it's about a little over two months. So um, we're moving along quite well, but that has been because of a very um, explicit recruitment strategy focused on um, um, and, and putting dollars towards uh, marketing um, to get in the um, caregivers that we're interested in reaching to be able to develop these interventions. And managing hard to reach populations means thinking about things like if you're working with low income populations, um, there are certain characteristics of low income populations that you have to think about and consider in your protocol and design, like individuals may change phone numbers frequently. So do you have uh, different ways of being able to connect with participants, particularly if it's a longitudinal study design, people change residences regularly when they're very low income. And so again, do you have a different way of being able to connect with your participants regularly so that you don't lose them? Um, is there a protocol in place so that you can um, connect with people very quickly once they indicate that they're interested so that we don't lose people due to um, large gaps in time between when they indicate that they're interested in participation and when somebody finally gets back around to uh, connecting um, with them. So some of the things that we did within our study to uh, with recruitment is we used participant registries, both the registry with the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, as well as the Michigan Center for Urban African American Age and Research. One of the things that we learned um, in our work of um, um, trying to work with the registries is that we needed to do some improvements in both of the registries to gather more caregiver specific information that um, initially the way that the registries were set up, we weren't really collecting. Um, caregiver information. And so we've been um, working to rectify that so that um, we would uh, be able to connect um, with caregivers that were already engaged with these groups. Um, sororities and fraternities for um, Black older adults um, are um, still very important ways in which um, people stay connected and engaged in community service. Um, and engage socially with other individuals. Um, I think this is um, something that may be a little bit different culturally um, in that when um, individuals join sororities and fraternities um, in college or sometimes um, as graduate students um, or as professionals later, that these, um, their engagement often continues and is a lifelong commitment and, um, you know, that individuals have. And so this has been a great way to uh, connect with uh, older um, adults that are uh, caregivers. Um, we've had fantastic um, recruitment um, by helping with church ministries. Um, that has changed, of course, related to COVID, but within um, churches, particularly larger churches, they almost always have a health ministry um, or some sort of health program that they're engaged in. Um, and so we, um, it's sort of, it's, you have to look at these relationships as mutually beneficial. It's not just about 
what you can take and I need participants, it's about what you can give. And so that means that, you know, if I'm looking for participants and I want to work with the church ministry, then that means that I'm going and giving some sort of an educational seminar or participating in their health fair or doing something with that group to um, give back to that group. Um, and then also, you know, I then get the opportunity to talk about the work that I'm doing and to engage caregivers. And that's really worked out fantastically well. Um, the community education events sponsored by the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center have been um, really helpful in engaging with uh, members of the um, community to talk about the work that we're doing, um, to put a name with a, a face, um, as well as to connect our staff with um, the community. Um, and so we've um, been able to reach a lot of people um, through these sorts of community engagement events as well. And then Facebook has really been, and social media in general has really been helpful um, in recruiting large numbers of uh, participants. Um, that has been a large learning curve for us. Um, we've had to deal with a lot of um, security hacks <laughs> and managing uh, fraudulent data because of the number of responses. As I mentioned, we have around 120 participants um, through our current survey, but um, we've had many, many, many more impressions and probably at least twice as many surveys that weren't um, good surveys that we've had to um, toss out. Um, and so it does require us a little bit more um, labor intensive um, to go that route, uh, particularly went through an automated um, sort of a survey. Um, so our survey that we're currently doing takes about 45 minutes for um, individuals to uh, complete. Um, some of the things that we found um, in the surveys that we've been administering to Black caregivers is that um, obesity is a large um, problem with the vast majority of our caregivers identifying as being at least um, overweight, um, the majority dealing with hypertension, um, and a significant number of individuals managing um, diabetes and almost always diabetes and hypertension together. Um, there's various relationships between care recipients and the caregiver. Um, many individuals for, for the most part um, have been parents. Um, we've also seen um, spouses and um, um, other relatives um, that have been engaged in care. Generally these other relatives are like um, nieces and nephews um, that may be supporting um, care for a person that has a uh, um, dementia-related diagnosis. And the other thing that we found is um, the sorts of adaptive coping strategies that individuals are using. We're using the coping and adaptation processing um, scale that asks people about how do they manage a stressful situation. And it asks them um, questions about how they respond. And then um, these questions fall into um, different uh, domains. And the end of the um, questions within this, um, this uh, particular survey that individuals most readily identify with, that our caregivers most readily identify with, were the three that were listed here of um, using spirituality as a means to be able to um, cope, um, take in their past experiences, so they're experiencing and um, managing care or dealing with it before, as well as um, information gathering. Um, so trying to get as much information as possible to help them to, to manage um, care and support. And so when individuals had uh, what is considered adaptive coping, according to the scale, it was more uh, significantly associated with positive physical health. And so we did the Promise Global Health Scale, um, which um, you can, um, has two outcomes, both physical health and mental health. And so when individuals were um, um, having um, effective ad effectively or um, um, uh, adaptively coping, they had improved physical health as well as mental health. Um, we had a perceived um, a social support scale, and so their social support was much higher. Um, their perceived social support was much higher when they were adaptively coping, and they had um, increased self-efficacy for controlling upsetting thoughts. And so uh, with this particular skill, it asked questions about a person's ability to control thoughts when like their loved one was asking them repetitive questions um, and particular behaviors that could be maybe challenging for uh, family members to, to manage. But 
um, adaptive coping made a difference in all of this. And from our current national caregiver um, study, which we have not yet published the results on that, one of the interesting things that we also found was that, um, of course, um, it um, corresponds with some of the things that we know that the longer that a person is providing um, care, the more likely they were to um, be more effectively coping and more um, likely to demonstrate adaptive um, coping the longer that they were providing care. And we also saw increased um, alcohol use um, when there was increased um, instrumental um, activities of daily living, um, but not for the ADLs, which means that the more challenging um, behaviors to deal with was when individuals uh, with dementia maybe are up and moving around and perhaps maybe having some safety issues or more of the behavioral concerns. And that was more challenging to deal with perhaps than um, in the later stages of dementia when individuals may be more bed bound um, that and, and, and the family member likely has uh, learned to at that point to manage care a bit better. And so what that also means that we hadn't really thought about that we're working on is um, providing some additional um, content and think, helping caregivers to think about healthy coping outside of um, alcohol and um, drug use, you know, particularly with marijuana now being, um, you know, legal here in uh, Michigan and in many other states is thinking about healthy coping for um, individuals. So uh, the current work that we're doing is we're testing the utility of a grip strength and cognitive assessment. Um, I've um, got some work with colleagues where we've um, identified a relationship between grip strength or how strong um, a person is, their physical strength in their hand uh, with their cognition. Um, and so we are looking at the utility of um, adding in a grip strength and cognitive assessment measure that can um, within our uh, survey design that we can be um, include within our later clinical trial that we're planning. Um, again, we've rolled out that national caregiver survey where we're aiming to uh, capture um, data from about 385 caregivers. And so we're steadily working towards that and moving along um, our next step is to have um, focus groups with Black caregivers to better understand the experience of providing a care for a person with dementia um, and how, um, what sorts of resources individuals have been using and to get some feedback on the, um, the intervention that we're uh, designing, which currently is looking like a 12-week um, peer-based support intervention um, in which individuals would have the opportunity to uh, connect with other caregivers and connect with a, a facilitator each week to work on some um, a weekly strategy on um, improving the ways in which they are performing self-care, so taking care of themselves as well as um, um, being able to provide care for the person that they are um, responsible for. So our next steps are really taking a look more at the relationships between health and adaptive coping strategies selected. Um, we're looking at leveraging technology as a tool to provide education, connect caregivers with one another and help them to more easily identify resources. So we've been in the initial stages of um, that uh, piece of development and hope to move that along. And then um, finally uh, developing this you know, community informed um, intervention for um, caregivers that, you know, is something that is sustainable that uh, communities can and community groups that are interested in um, caregivers can take on and uh, encourage people to engage in so that we can get more support for caregivers and particularly some of our most vulnerable caregivers. So I thank you for taking this um, journey with me this afternoon to talk about the work that, you know, I've been um, doing and some of the needs of Black caregivers and how um, ultimately this will result in an ideal intervention for them. And so we'll take a look at your uh, questions, if there are any questions. All right. Again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to place them in the Q&A box. And while you all are doing that, I am going to place the link for the evaluation in the chat box. 
So, yes, I see that someone is saying there's little information out there for black people, and that's absolutely um, true. That's what we're working on is getting more culturally relevant information out to um, uh, to uh, black caregivers. And let me see, I can share my screen again. I get excited. Let's see here. Here we go. And so um, these are my grandmothers, the two of them that um, both had dementia, Lula and Betsy. And I know someone had asked about how to get in contact with me. Here is my um, email address. And then you can also reach me through Twitter. So there's my contact information. So big shout out to all of my team that have helped in this work and all of the um, mentors who have um, supported this work. Um, is this saying, I think the question is about um, dealing with secrecy. Is that what the question is about? like secrecy around dementia. I think um, if that's the question, I think that, that that's something that is, I don't know that it's unique necessarily to black folks. I think that older adults in general just really value their independence. And that's something that I found in the work that I do with in pain management as well, is that there's this fear about being dependent on others that older adults tend to have that sort of is an undercurrent in their decision making and the ways in which they choose to interact with others and how they choose to get their families involved and even utilize support that is sort of like using support indicates that they need people. And so and they don't want to necessarily have to need anybody because that's this idea that it's this downward spin from there. Um, and that ultimately you'll end up in the nursing home. You know, the more help that you you need, I think, is sort of where people's um, minds maybe go. And so I think the ways that we deal with this secrecy around um, change in cognition and um, needing support is to make it more widely available. I think it's really difficult for people to connect with services. And one of the challenges we have is that we, people don't necessarily know what normal aging is. And so when people have problems as they're aging, like whether they're problems with memory, problems with pain, or other sorts of issues that people associate with old age, they don't think about it as a disability and then access disability related um, services. So I think just really the more we can get information out and particularly um, about community groups um, that um, can uh, make a difference. Um, yes, we are still definitely recruiting for folks. If you're a caregiver and you want to participate in the focus groups um, or you or you could be a past caregiver or current caregiver, um, you can shoot me an email. Um, if you want to take the survey and you haven't taken it already, shoot me an email um, and we can get you the link to the survey if you're um, here. So we would love to have you and thank you for asking. And yes, we'll share the results from the focus groups as well as the um, surveys. We plan on sharing all of the um, results. All right, Sharia, could you go to the next slide, please? Oh, sure. Thank you. There you go. And thank you all again for um, your attention. And thank you so much, Sharia, for the wonderful information that you shared today. We have um, another presentation that's coming up and it's gonna be about successful aging through financial empowerment. So um, there's the link to register and then you can also go to our website if you're interested in attending that um, as well. And then if you go to the next one, the last slide. And then um, again, if there are any more questions, then let us know if you want to learn how to um, be in the loop and find out what's going on in the community, more center activities, then please feel free to subscribe to our monthly e-newsletter. You have the option to um, find us on any of the social media outlets and again on our website. So if um, you have anything else, Sharia, that you want to add? 
That's it. Again, thank you all for um, coming. We're uh, glad that you were here for, you know, the presentation. Uh, please do feel free to reach out if you have additional questions or you want to talk offline. I'm, I'm happy to do that. All right, we are done. So thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your day and have a good afternoon.